By the middle of the 19th century, it was apparent to many in Washington that America's founding fathers had left a legacy with two loopholes. A loose republic of states, perhaps divisible, with liberty and justice for some. In less than 75 years, the republic had grown from a colonial possession into a continental nation. Territory gained after the Mexican War stretched the country from sea to shining sea. Yet this new land threatened to divide the nation. Most republics throughout the course of history had not survived. The Americans of the first half of the 19th century were uncertain whether their republic would survive a serious crisis or would it break apart. Tensions were rising between the North and the South. Each wanted to settle the West in its own distinct image. The North is far more populous, far more economically developed than the South, but it has not exercised real political power in the nation. The South has had a stranglehold on the Democratic Party, on the presidency, on the Supreme Court. The nation was at a crossroads. The power struggle between North and South was escalating into a crisis that demanded an extraordinary president. As it turned out, Zachary Taylor was not that man. Number 12, Zachary Taylor. Whig, 1849 to 1850, 64 years old, from Louisiana. Zachary Taylor was a celebrity, a Mexican war hero who'd helped to win over half a million square miles of new land for the nation. He was also a political unknown. Zachary Taylor was someone who was not seeking the presidency. Both parties came to him and wanted him to be their candidate. As a war hero, he appealed to the North. As a Louisiana landowner and slaveholder, he appealed to the South. He had no obvious agenda, but in the end, he would surprise them all. There's something about Zachary Taylor. If I had to pick out a prototypical pre-Civil War American, I certainly would pick Old Rough and Ready. Taylor's nom de guerre, Old Rough and Ready, was as much a tribute to his fighting spirit as it was for his slovenly appearance. He had none of the polish of a professional politician and was not a great communicator. Taylor had never registered to vote and didn't even vote in his own election. Despite outward appearances, he was really a Washington insider. His army position had been arranged by his second cousin, James Madison. Robert E. Lee was his fourth cousin once removed, and Jefferson Davis had been his son-in-law. As president, Taylor deferred to others, going so far as to declare he would not exercise his veto power. Taylor didn't really see the presidency as a very powerful office, and he, uh, he was actually strongly influenced by members of his cabinet and by certain members of Congress. He did say that he believed that the slavery issue should be decided by Congress, and Congress would be the ruling body, and that he would go along with whatever Congress proposed. The slavery debate was beginning to get ugly. The fragile peace between North and South, established 30 years earlier by the Missouri Compromise, was starting to crumble. Well, when Zachary Taylor came into office, the country was facing a serious crisis over the question of the expansion of slavery into new Western territory. On one side, Southern extremists were threatening secession if Congress didn't rule in their favor. On the other side, the clamor of Northern abolitionists was growing louder. In response, Senator Henry Clay created the Compromise of 1850 a bundle of bills designed to link the admission of California as a free state with some slavery measures favorable to the South. So this was a kind of package that Clay put before the Congress, 
giving some concessions to the slave states and some concessions to the free states, which he hoped uh, would, would go through and satisfy everybody. But the compromise didn't satisfy some people, including President Taylor. Taylor surprised a lot of people. Uh, he thought there was nothing to compromise about. He said, look, California should be admitted as a free state, and that's it. Taking back his promise, Taylor threatened to veto the compromise. Taylor insisted on going ahead, even at the risk of provoking southern state secession. Taylor's solution for the secessionists was somewhat simplistic. I'll hang him. And I might start with my son-in-law, Jefferson Davis, who was a senator from Mississippi at that time. I think his best moment was simply affirming the integrity of the nation in response to threats of disunion that were coming from the South as the controversy over the Compromise of 1850 intensified. Barely a year into his administration, Taylor was evolving into an ardent unionist. On a hot 4th of July in 1850, Taylor took a break from the political infighting to preside over a groundbreaking ceremony for the Washington Monument. Scorched by the summer sun, Taylor sought relief with a pitcher of milk and a bowl of cherries. Within hours, he complained of severe stomach pains. There are people who were proposing that he was actually poisoned by arsenic, that there was this conspiracy to get rid of him. Taylor died five days later. Most believed he succumbed to gastroenteritis, an inflammation of the intestines. But there were lingering suspicions of foul play. It would take more than a century before anyone would know for certain. In 1991, an historian convinced Taylor's descendants to allow his body to be exhumed. Forensic analysis revealed no signs of foul play. Instead, they determined that a form of cholera was the most likely cause of Taylor's death. As far as I'm concerned, he definitively was not poisoned with arsenic. Where Taylor might have taken the country is a mystery, but it would soon move in an entirely different direction when Taylor's vice president assumed the presidency. Number 13, Millard Fillmore, Whig, 1850 to 1853, 50 years old, from New York. Unlucky number 13, Millard Fillmore was an accidental president. Some have called him the Gerald Ford of his day. Considered so unremarkable, a Millard Fillmore Society used to gather annually at his gravesite to lampoon his forgotten presidency. He was a rather strong president, considering the fact that he was a, an accidental president, and, not, and those presidents always have a difficult time establishing their, their mark. Millard Fillmore hadn't even met Zachary Taylor until after they were elected. Seen as Taylor's opposite, Fillmore was picked merely to balance the ticket geographically and politically. Fillmore was a northerner, an affable man who was always dressed impeccably. He was a bookworm and a hands-off manager. He aimed to please and appease rather than lead. He was a kind of colorless character who believed in compromise, who deferred to congressional leadership. According to most observers, bland, friendly, willing to make you feel that you had said something important, and just generally fitting in. And yet, behind this amiable personality lurked a man with backbone. Bitter at feeling overlooked by Taylor's cabinet, Fillmore fired all of them. Fillmore continued to exert his newfound power by reversing the policy of his predecessor and signing the Compromise of 1850 into law. Fillmore said, no, I'm in now and I'm going to change the government's policy. Taylor was all wrong about the Compromise of 1850. Fillmore supported slavery because he believed its abolition would lead to a collapse of the southern economy. 60% of U.S. exports came out of the cotton states by 1860. So to abolish slavery was to abolish an economic system. 
Fillmore also believed that slavery was protected by the Constitution and that by signing the compromise, he would somehow put the issue to rest forever. What he failed to grasp were the moral consequences, and he blamed abolitionists for making slavery an issue. He was totally opposed to the abolitionists. He thought they were troublemakers, fanatics. Fillmore was content with the compromise because he thought it would preserve the status quo. For some, however, it only served to strengthen their resolve against slavery. By supporting the compromise, Fillmore hoped to please everyone, but instead he ended up pleasing no one, including members of his own party. In the election of 1852, the Whigs wouldn't renominate him. So Fillmore went home to Buffalo, leaving behind one of the most forgettable presidencies in American history. Eleven presidents were generals before being elected. Washington, Jackson, Harrison, Taylor, Pierce, Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Ben Harrison, and Eisenhower. It was 1852, and the tenuous strands of the Compromise of 1850 were barely holding the nation together. Franklin Pierce appeared to be the perfect feel-good candidate. He was a Northern Democrat with strong ties to the South. Voters in both regions thought Pierce would bring balance and peace to the nation. He was known by everybody. Everybody knew him. Everybody liked him. That's how he got nominated to begin with. There wasn't anybody who didn't like him. Number 14, Franklin Pierce, Democrat, 1853 to 1857, 48 years old, from New Hampshire. Franklin Pierce was practically handed the presidency because he was offensive to no one. He would leave office reviled by all. Pierce had terrible timing throughout his life. Uh, even his timing of when he got elected president was, was poor. Everybody called him Handsome Frank. The word that was used often in describing was elegant. Extremely outgoing, very charismatic. Even people who didn't like him felt he was a wonderfully charming, interesting uh, person. Pierce was well known as a man about town, a social and political butterfly of sorts with a penchant for drinking, often to excess. Being involved in politics meant being in taverns, meant slapping people on the back, buying them a drink, and the drinking culture in America this time was enormous. I mean, one scholar called it the alcoholic republic. Whether he was an alcoholic is hard to to judge today, but he probably was. There were times in his life, however, when he did not drink and when he, alcohol did not seem to play an important role in his life, and that includes the time he was president. By all accounts, Pierce managed to stay sober during his presidency. But some believe he was not emotionally stable because of a terrible personal tragedy he suffered just weeks after his election. Pierce, his wife Jane, and their son Benny were in a train wreck. Pierce and his wife were unscathed, but their 11-year-old son was killed. The top of his head had literally been taken off. And right in front of his parents, uh, Franklin Pierce grabbed his cloak and threw it over Benny's body, hoping that Jane wouldn't see it, uh, but she did, of course, and that was a terrible tragedy to them. Pierce and his wife had already lost two other children to disease. Benny was their last surviving child. To have your remaining son, the light of your life, Benny, killed in front of your eyes in a train accident. Who could imagine the horror that that would instill in anyone? Added to Pierce's troubles was the death of his vice president, William Rufus King, six weeks after the inauguration. And things were about to get worse. Early in 1854, Pierce received a visit from members of his own party, including Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas. Douglas informed Pierce he was sponsoring a bill called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Kansas-Nebraska Act is one of the key moments in all of American political history. The act was designed to repeal the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which banned slavery in states above the southern border of Missouri. The intent was to let the new territories of Kansas and Nebraska, both north of the boundary, decide for themselves if they wanted slavery or not. 
Douglas promised to make Pierce's presidency a living nightmare if Pierce didn't support the scheme. The president should have said, no, you're opening a can of worms, a hornet's nest. But no, Pierce is weak. Pierce can be bullied. And Douglas forces him basically to say, OK, the administration will support this. And so Pierce basically caved into them. And as a consequence, most of the Northern Democrats in the Senate and exactly half of the Northern Democrats in the House supported the bill, and that was just enough to get it through Congress. Anti-slavery groups in the North just went berserk over this bill. They went ballistic. Among the outraged was a little-known politician from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was so angered by the blatant pro-slavery act that he helped create a radical new political party to oppose the expansion of slavery, the Republican Party. Previously, he talked about slavery now and then, but basically he'd just been a fairly ordinary Whig politician. The Kansas-Nebraska Act brings Lincoln back into politics, and it brings him into politics as a spokesman against the expansion of slavery. It galvanizes Lincoln. Meanwhile, in the Kansas Territory, anti- and pro-slavery settlers were literally fighting it out. On May 21st, 1856, pro-slavery forces burned the abolitionist stronghold of Lawrence, Kansas, down to the ground. The whole political situation begins to disintegrate, and Pierce is completely incapable of putting it back together again. Pierce failed to see his role in the deterioration of the Union. He genuinely thought he had a shot at a second term, but even his own party rejected him. Pierce returned home to New Hampshire, his reputation ruined. Several years later, after his wife Jane died, he returned to heavy drinking and lived his remaining years as a recluse, perhaps the saddest legacy of any president. Presidents are, what can I say, they're victims of whatever happens both during and after their terms. So I think Pierce's reputation will not recuperate anytime soon. But as tragic as Pierce's presidency had been, it would pale in comparison to his successors. Number 15, James Buchanan, Democrat, 1857 to 1861, 65 years old, from Pennsylvania. James Buchanan is often ranked at or near the bottom in these polls to determine the best and the worst of the American presidents. I think the reason that he's often rated near or at the bottom is because actions that he took during his presidency probably hastened the coming of the Civil War. He did fail, but I think he failed with integrity, and I think he needs to be given credit for at least trying. I think that he should be maligned, but we've got to get it right. Really, what he deserves his last place rating for is near treason. James Buchanan was one of the most politically accomplished presidents America has ever had. He had been a congressman, foreign minister, senator, and secretary of state. What he'd achieved in life was due to hard work and a fastidious nature. He would stay up late at night to attend to the smallest of details. Buchanan was different in another way. He never married and is often referred to as America's only bachelor president. There are folks in the United States who say that uh, James Buchanan is our first homosexual president. The allegation arose from the intimate friendship he had shared with Franklin Pierce's vice president, William Rufus King, a man he had lived with for 16 years. There really is not a lot of hard evidence. There are three or four mentions at the time of Buchanan and his wife, or Aunt Nancy. These two men are Aunt Nancy's. Now, King was part of this circle of dandies, they called them. And there certainly was some sense in this group of men that they were having homosexual relations. It's very hard to make any kind of determination about something like that, even about someone living today, let alone someone living in the 1850s. 
Buchanan had his charming niece, Harriet Lane, serve as his White House hostess. Since Harriet wasn't Buchanan's wife, she was called the First Lady, a term coined to describe her role. While Harriet presided over social life at the White House, Buchanan presided over a house rapidly dividing. His decision to endorse the Constitution written by the pro-slavery settlers in Kansas made Buchanan appear to be a supporter of the South and a traitor to the North. The idea that the president will try to force slavery into a territory where it's clear that a majority of the settlers don't want it completely discredits his administration in the eyes of large numbers of Northerners, including Northern Democrats, not just Republicans. Everything that uh, James Buchanan does for the last part of his administration is so pro-Southern that he does not do in the classic presidential oath preserve and defend and protect the United States. Ultimately, Buchanan's management of the battle in Kansas did nothing to settle the slavery issue. It only made it worse. Slavery, couched in the mantra of states' rights, was now the defining issue in the historic election of 1860. On November 6, 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president. It was now only a matter of months before the South would lose its ally in the White House. In anticipation of an anti-slavery president, South Carolina seceded from the Union on December 20th, 1860. As a lame duck president, James Buchanan denied the legality of secession, but didn't do anything to stop it. Was he being weak at that moment and indecisive? Probably. Was he scared to death? Certainly. Did he have a sense that this was an incredibly dangerous moment? Definitely. Within weeks, six more states left the Union, and eight slaveholding states sat on the fence, becoming border states. On February 9, 1861, the Confederate States of America, now composed of seven states, elected Jefferson Davis as their new president. One month later, Buchanan's presidency came to an end. He was tremendously relieved to set aside the burden of office and hand it over to Lincoln. On his last day, Buchanan said to Lincoln, if you are as happy to be entering the presidency as I am to be leaving it, then you are a very happy man. Unknown to America at the time, James Buchanan had quietly purchased several slaves and sent them north, granting them their freedom. Abraham Lincoln's presidency was so remarkable that Lincoln himself transcended the presidency, becoming an American icon. Today, Lincoln is seen as a marble figure, a martyr, a phenomenon. Lincoln was the father of a second American Revolution and the political legacy we live with today. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yet none of this was ever Lincoln's original intent. Number 16, Abraham Lincoln, Republican, 1861 to 1865. 52 years old, from Illinois. Lincoln was a conservative in the sense that he wanted to preserve and restore the Union as it had existed before the secession of the southern states and the beginning of the war. But the very events of the war pushed him step by step to the left, toward a more radical position, which eventually became revolutionary. Lincoln was not the great emancipator. He becomes the great emancipator, to some extent against his own intention. I think that Lincoln shows you what, what greatness is, really. It is the capacity to grow, to understand a situation, to change. In Lincoln's lifetime, people either loved him or hated him. One thing they couldn't do was ignore him. 
He was very magnetic. He drew people to him, young people especially, young men who were active in politics, thought of him as a god. He had a famous sense of humor. He had an amazing storehouse of anecdotes and jokes for every occasion. It would drive some people crazy, even as president. Um, he would have a story ready that would illustrate a point. Hidden behind the humor was a very complex man. Lincoln obsessed over matters and often suffered prolonged periods of sadness, frustration, and even despair. Campaign literature called him Honest Abe, banking on his compulsion for seeking the truth. His other nickname, the Rail Splitter, was more of a political marketing invention in the Jacksonian tradition, capitalizing on Lincoln's working class roots to appeal to the common man. Lincoln was very much a politician. He loved the game of politics. He played it very well. He was an extraordinarily ambitious man, like so many politicians who rise to the top are. From childhood, Lincoln was driven to make something of his life, to climb up out of poverty. He worked hard and relied on his wits, as he had not been blessed with good looks. In the South, they attacked him as a a scoundrelly looking wretch, uh, the cross between a nutmeg dealer and a horse swapper, whatever that means. Lincoln turned his appearance into a positive by disarming people with self-deprecating humor. Once, after being called two-faced, he said, if I were two-faced, would I be wearing this one? Lincoln was his own best spinmeister. Once elected president, Lincoln chose a cabinet of intellectual equals, just as John F. Kennedy did a century later. In Lincoln's case, four of his secretaries had been his political rivals. He was a judicious delegator of authority, but he always reserved the ultimate decision for himself. Lincoln's election had been a political disaster for the Southern slave power. But his initial intention was just to halt the expansion of slavery into the Western territories. He said, if I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do that. If I could save it by freeing some and leaving others in bondage, I would do that too. He never had anything but moral outrage about it. But he, like most anti-slavery men, felt that the way to kill it, the way to destroy the institution was to contain it and let it suffocate from within. Waiting for Lincoln on his first day in office was a letter from Major Robert Anderson, the commander of Fort Sumter, located on an island in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. Anderson warned that without a shipment of provisions, he would have to surrender to the rebels. Lincoln had three options. He could order a surrender, an attack, or send provisions. He chose the latter. So basically, Lincoln said to Jefferson Davis, if you let this food go in peacefully, it will be uh, a, a symbolic manifestation of our sovereignty over this fort, the United States sovereignty. If you stop it, then the burden of responsibility for starting a war will be on your shoulders. Before Lincoln's supply ships arrived, Confederate President Jefferson Davis ordered his men to attack the fort. The first shot was fired. On April 12, 1861, the Civil War had begun. The violence at Fort Sumter motivated four more states to join the Confederacy. Four others remained on the fence. Fort Sumter was surrendered to the South, but Major Anderson saved the American flag that had flown above it and brought it to New York City. They took that tattered, ripped flag. It was very much like the World Trade Center flag that was displayed all over New York in the fall of 2001. And the flag inspired people. It created flag mania, patriotic fever. In a way, without Sumter, Lincoln might not have stirred up the Union. Um, 
to a move that was necessary to fight to restore the Union, to preserve the Union. By an act of shrewd calculation, Lincoln had baited the South into striking the first blow of the Civil War. Yet neither he nor Jefferson Davis anticipated what was about to unfold. It would be the first and only American presidency completely defined by war. Lincoln, who made Thanksgiving a national holiday, was also the first to pardon a turkey at Thanksgiving. He named it Jack. In the spring of 1861, Abraham Lincoln became commander-in-chief at the helm of the military effort to save the Union. Possessing no military expertise and humbled at the prospect of making life and death decisions, Lincoln gave himself a crash course on military strategy. Lincoln did what any intelligent person would do. He went to the Library of Congress and took out books on military strategy and uh, military administration and taught himself. Lincoln also became personally fascinated with the technology of modern warfare. Within a year, he was well-versed in military tactics and strategy. Yet nothing prepared Lincoln for the problems he was to experience with his generals. In August of 1861, Lincoln was furious upon hearing that Major General John C. Fremont had issued an Emancipation Proclamation in the border state of Missouri, becoming the first to free slaves owned by Confederates. Fearing Fremont's action would incite slave owners in all of the border states to join the Confederacy, Lincoln nullified Fremont's action and relieved him of duty. In February 1862, Lincoln's war effort was suddenly rocked by personal tragedy. His 11-year-old son, Willie, died from typhoid fever. I think Lincoln saw most of himself in Willie and just never, never quite escaped from the veil of very deep melancholy that enveloped him in 1862. In an effort to properly mourn their son's death, the Lincolns decided to temporarily leave the White House and move to the soldiers' home an asylum for wounded soldiers in Northwest Washington. Finding themselves at peace there among the soldiers, the Lincolns adopted the home as their summer residence, turning Lincoln into a commuter for one-fourth of his presidency. From then on, the war consumed Lincoln. He worked night and day, seven days a week, 18 or more hours a day. He was so anxious to stay on top of the latest war news, he would sometimes stay late or even all night at the U.S. Telegraph office. In April 1862, exactly a year after Fort Sumter, the Union Army won a major, critically important victory at the Battle of Shiloh. But it came at a horrendous cost. Nearly 24,000 men were killed, wounded, or missing after the battle. Carnage triggered a turning point when Lincoln and others realized they were going to have to wage a total war. He privately recognized the need to refocus the purpose of the war from merely preserving the Union to addressing the greater moral issue of slavery. In July of 1862, Lincoln confided to his cabinet that he was prepared to surpass the legal powers of the presidency and exploit his unique wartime power as commander-in-chief. He announced his intention to abolish slavery in the rebellious states, not only to undermine the Confederacy's economic strength, but to end slavery in America forever. On September 22, 1862, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation to the public. This war, which began as a conservative effort to restore the status quo antebellum, evolved into a revolutionary war to destroy the Old South and its social and economic system. That's the transformative moment 
in American history. That's the second Declaration of Independence. That's the moment when Lincoln reaches the level of the Founding Fathers, where he fulfills the promise of the Declaration that had been so long denied to so many millions of individuals who had been denied freedom. The problem was that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't win battles. Throughout 1862 and 1863, the Union enjoyed success in the West, but that was overshadowed by devastating losses in the East. By June 1863, the military situation in Virginia was getting desperate. Robert E. Lee's rebel army was on a winning streak and marching towards Pennsylvania. It came to a climax in the first days of July near the small farm town of Gettysburg. The battle was supposed to be the mother of all battles. It was supposed to end the Civil War. Three horrifying days of massacre ensued. The battleground was soaked in blood. Photographers produced morbid images of the carnage, exposing the nation to the horror of war. These were America's sons, brothers, husbands, lying dead on the battlefield. Lincoln himself sank into despair, overcome by the terrible loss. In November, Lincoln traveled to Gettysburg to help commemorate the battlefield as a national military cemetery. Lincoln spoke for two minutes, and what he managed to do in this elegiac masterpiece is redefine uh, the commitment of America to the Declaration of Independence, to the principles that all men are created equal, to laud the sacrifice of people who had given their lives that the nation might live. He believed that America was fighting not just for the promise of today, but we, what he called a vast future also, that all should have an equal chance and an unfettered start in the race of life, as he put it. As inspiring as Lincoln's Gettysburg Address had been, Americans were weary of the bloodshed. By 1864, most wanted to see an end to the war. That year, Lincoln ran for re-election against one of his former generals, George B. McClellan, who ran on a platform that promised to negotiate an end to the war if he were elected. It would be a contentious election that would test the resolve of a nation and its president. Nine presidents did not attend college. Washington, Jackson, Van Buren, Taylor, Fillmore, Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, Cleveland, and Truman. In the fall of 1864, Abraham Lincoln was running for his political life against General George B. McClellan. It was a time when Americans could have ended the war by casting their ballots for McClellan who campaigned on a platform that implied he would negotiate an end to the war and, possibly, repeal the Emancipation Proclamation. But Lincoln is not willing to take those steps that some people say would guarantee his re-election, rescinding the Emancipation Proclamation, agreeing to an armistice with the South, agreeing to recognize the Southern Confederacy. When he did refused to back away, it looked like it would be at the cost of his re-election, because it looked like he would be defeated. Looking back, it seems inevitable Lincoln's going to win, but it certainly didn't appear that way in 1864. Two months before the election, the tide turned for Lincoln. General William Tecumseh Sherman had burned Atlanta would, ten weeks later, begin his infamous march to the sea. Suddenly, the Union Army had momentum, and so did Lincoln. Even though America was engaged in a terrible, bloody war, so many casualties, just unimaginable bloodshed and devastation, he still won 56% of the vote in the loyal states in 1864. That in itself is an extraordinary testament to people's faith in Lincoln. It was a bittersweet victory.
the misery of the war had taken its toll on Lincoln, emotionally and physically. It's hard to find an American president who aged more than Abraham Lincoln did in three and a half years. I think what you see in his face is knowing that he bore some of the responsibility for this whole disaster. Four years to the day after Lincoln first took the oath of office, he was taking it again on March 4th, 1865. This time around, Lincoln was a changed man. His visits to the front lines, his experience of living among the wounded at the soldier's home, and his periodic commute between there and the White House brought him face to face with average Americans and contraband slaves. It had all deeply affected Lincoln, making him empathetic to the humanity of all men. Speaking at his second inaugural, he signaled his growth as a politician and compassion as a man. In what may be the most moving speech ever written by a president, he laid out his roadmap for peace and reconstruction of the nation, pledging malice toward none and charity for all. He's talking about democracy. He's talking about liberty. He's talking about the, the necessity of coming to terms with the legacy of slavery for American history. On April 9, 1865, just weeks after Lincoln's inauguration, Robert E. Lee surrendered his Confederate Army of Northern Virginia to Ulysses S. Grant. The war was nearly over. Soon after, in what would be his last speech, Lincoln showed no signs of vindictiveness. Echoing the same themes from his inaugural address, he called upon the nation to heal itself. He spoke about giving favorable terms to the South, and for the first time in public, about granting the black man the right to vote. It would be very easy for Lincoln to say at the end of the war, when, when Union victory is completely guaranteed, God's on our side. This is what presidents nowadays say. They know what God believes. They got a direct pipeline. Lincoln doesn't do that. Lincoln says, we don't know what God's will is. We've got to rely on our own judgment. A couple of evenings later, on April 14th, Good Friday, the Lincolns attended Ford's Theater to see the comedy, Our American Cousin. It was Lincoln's last night on Earth. Abraham Lincoln had grown up revering the Founding Fathers and the American democratic experiment. It was because of this first revolution that Lincoln was able to enjoy political freedom and equal opportunity. But by trying to save the republic the Founding Fathers had created, Lincoln transformed it and himself. Lincoln faced the greatest crisis the country had ever seen, and he rises to the occasion. But in rising to the occasion, he he changes his views. Lincoln came to see that everyone, no matter what their race, creed, or religion, had a right to live the American dream. I think what America is at its best today is a reflection of the steps he took to preserve the Union and to eradicate slavery and to ensure democracy and equal opportunity. I think the fact that we enjoy the opportunity to debate and to quarrel um, while retaining a single national spirit and a national purpose is all the result of Lincoln's achievement and Lincoln's sacrifice.